Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions in the Quran, Innama ya'muru masajid Allah, man amana billahi wal yawmin akh, wa aqama as-salah, wa ata az-zakah, wa lam yakhsha illa Allah, fa'asa an yakun, fa'asa ulaika an yakunu min al-muqtadeen. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in this beautiful ayah, that indeed the houses of Allah, the masajid of Allah, are maintained by those who believe in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and in the last day. And then he goes further to clarify the description of these believers. And that is that they establish the salah and they pay zakat. So when you look at the establishment of the salah and the payment of zakat, those are two qualities. Those are two qualities that describe this type of believer who takes an interest in maintaining the houses of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And let's be clear, the houses of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala are not just used for salah. The houses of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala are for the remembrance of Allah. The houses of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala are where our children can play. The houses of Allah is the hub. It was always the hub of Islamic education. The starts with the masjid and then there's a school and then there are homes and then there are families that are all centered around that masjid. And those who are responsible for maintaining the masjid are those who believe in Allah. They have firm faith in Allah and the, the home of the hereafter. And they establish the salat. So there's an affinity to the masjid because that is the place where they pray. And they pay zakat, meaning they spend from their wealth to maintain. As Allah began the ayat with maintaining the house of Allah. And the maintenance of the house of Allah is not by occupying it per se, but also by spending from your wealth to maintain the house. As Allah included in the verse, those who paid the zakat. So you can see the direct correlation between the maintenance of the house of Allah and those who take from their wealth to make sure that that maintenance is upheld. And they don't fear anyone except Allah. We don't fear loss of our wealth. We don't fear the blame of those who find fault. We don't fear anyone. Lam yakhsha illa Allah. We only fear Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And that is to drive home the point, and Allah mentioned that right after paying the zakat, because the thing that the human being is, in, is most in fear of is the loss of his wealth. The loss of his wealth. Which is why the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and many hadith emphasized and highlighted the fact that when a person gives sadaqah, when he gives charity, gives zakat, it does not subtract from your wealth. It doesn't take from your wealth. All the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam mentioned in an authentic hadith, La ma naqasat sadaqatun min ma'an. That sadaqah does not cause your wealth to decrease. Giving charity doesn't take anything away from your wealth. Physically, it may look like your numbers are decreasing, but with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, your numbers are increasing. With Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, your number of good deeds are increasing. Your numbers may decrease in terms of your wealth, but your numbers are increasing. So all you are making is a deposit that you will come and collect on the Day of Judgment. When you take money from your pocket and you spend, you don't lose. Just like when you take money and you invest it in property or you invest it in some type of business venture, you don't lose out on the money. You just invested it in something that you're hoping for an ROI, a return on investment. Well, in the hereafter, we have an, a spiritual ROI, a spiritual return on investment, and that is taking from your wealth from out of your pocket and investing it in the schools and in the masajid, the houses of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and get your return in this life as well as in the hereafter. Your return in this life is seeing Islam spread. It's seeing Muslim children becoming educated. Your return in this life is having a place to pray, having a place to prostrate. Your, your return on investment is a salat jariyah that you invested in something that even after your death will continue, will continue to benefit Muslims as well as people of other faiths in this community. And you are in your grave buried six feet deep and you continue to benefit from it. SubhanAllah, there's nothing greater than that. So when you take from your wealth out of your pocket and you invest it in the masjid, you invest it in Islamic schools, 
You invested in Islamic education. There is a return on investment in this life as well as in the hereafter. This piece of property that Tarabiya School sits on, it sits on 2.3 acres, the largest piece of property in this particular area. Central location that Muslims in this area can get to without any hassle, without any problem. And that is for prayer, as well as to drop their children off at the school, as well as to come and make a physical contribution to the school through hard dedication of their time and their energy. And all that we are requesting from the Muslims, from the believers, is to encourage you to fulfill your responsibility of maintaining the house of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And through your contributions, we will be fulfilling our responsibility to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's deen and for the future of our children. As the scholars of Islam, they say, Al-awlad nisful hadir wa kullu al-akhir. That the children are half, they are half of our present and they are all of our future. Children, they are half of our future, they are half of our present and they are all of our future. And when you think about what we are investing in now, years from now, maybe our children will have a place to be employed. Years, of now, years from now, our children will come back and teach at the school and educate their children and other Muslim children in the school. So the school was not just a hub for Islamic education, but it also provided employment for Muslims. It also provided an opportunity for Muslims to get involved, to you know, rack up some good deeds for themselves in the hereafter. So with this $700,000 deficit, what can we do with this as a ummah? How can we satisfy this deficit of $700,000 in two years? Very easy task. If there are 350 Muslims sitting in a room right now, and each one of them made a payment of $500 forward and made a pledge to pay another $500 during the month of Ramadan. And never to forget that the Prophet ﷺ was the most generous in Ramadan. There's no other time to be generous like the month of Ramadan. In fact, the Prophet ﷺ was never asked for anything on a normal case, on a normal occasion, except that he never told anyone no. Because this was not his home. This was simply a rest stop for him. As the Prophet ﷺ instructed us, Kun fi dunya ka gharib aw sabil. Be in this world as if you are a traveler or a wayfarer, someone just passing by. Not holding on. Because you think about the wealth that you have right now. If you were to die, Allah forbid, tomorrow, none of that goes with you. None of that goes with you. But when you send it forward, your return on investment will be waiting for you in the hereafter. So if there are 350 Muslims listening to this now, sitting in the room listening to this now, and you all decided to give $500, which is not a lot of money, $500 that you decided to give today, and then to make a pledge for another $500 during the month of Ramadan. And even in the month of Ramadan, you would probably have more. You would probably have more in Ramadan, but all we're asking for is $500. Now, and another $500 in the month of Ramadan. We could clear this $700,000 deficit in two years. We could be done with this in two years. If 350 Muslims gave $1,000 in a year, we would cover half of it, and in the next year, we could cover the other half and be done with this. And then we could also utilize whatever we give as a means of approaching Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, which is called tawassul. Tawassul is where you do a good deed, and then you turn around and you ask Allah, based upon that good deed, to give you something. And the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he mentioned in the hadith of three men who were trapped in a cave. And one of them said, I had two parents who were elderly. And I used to milk the cow, and I would not even give my children a drink from the milk until my parents drank from it first. So on one day, I milked the cow, and I went to go give my mother and father a drink from the milk, and they were asleep, and I hated to wake my parents up. 
And my children were at my feet, begging me and crying me for the milk, but I would not give them anything to drink until my parents drank from it first. He said, oh Allah, if I did this for your sake, then remove this boulder that is covering, covering the mouth of the cave so that we can get out. And the boulder moved a little bit, but not enough for them to get out. The second one, he said, oh Allah, I had a female cousin that I loved more than anyone else, as a man would love a woman. And I desired her so much. And I made an offer of some money, a sum of money for her to allow me to satisfy my desires with her. But she refused. But as time progressed, she became impoverished. As time progressed, she became indigent and poor, and she really needed the money. So she came to me so that I could satisfy, the, satisfy my desires with her. And I gave her a certain amount. He said, when I lay down to satisfy my desires with her, she looked at me and she said, Ya Abdullah, ittaqi la wa la tafukkul khatim illa bi haqqiha. She said to me, O oh Abdullah, servant of Allah, fear Allah. And do not take this from me except with due right. He said, I was so scared and so afraid. Because sometimes that's all it takes is a word for a person to utter a word to instill the fear of Allah in you. He said, I was so afraid at her comment that I got up off of her and I allowed her to keep the money and I never asked her for anything. He said, oh Allah, if I did this solely for your sake, then remove the boulder so that we can get out. And the last one was a man who hired some people to do a job. And all of them received their wages for their work with the exception of one man. He left before he got paid. So the man said, so I took his wealth and I began to develop it. The camels, cows, cattle, and I began to grow his, his wealth for him. So one day the man came back to me and said, Ya Abdullah, Atini Haki. Oh, servant of Allah, give me my right, give me my wages. So I looked at the man and I told him, All of what you see belongs to you. The man was so amazed, he said, Don't joke with me. He said, I'm not joking. Everything you see here is yours. I invested it for you. It's yours. It belongs to you. The man took everything and walked away. So he turned to Allah and said, Oh Allah, if I did this solely seeking your pleasure, then remove the boulder so that we can get out. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala removed the boulder so they can get out the cave. This is what is called tawassu. Using the good deeds that you do so that you can ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala later on based upon the purity of your intention in those deeds that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala give you something. So this is how we can cover this $700,000 debt. But this $700,000 deficit is that every Muslim, out of the 350 Muslims that are sitting here today, every Muslim dedicate $1,000, donate $1,000. And you can give all of the thousand up front, or you can give 500 up front and pledge to give another 500 during the month of Ramadan. And in two years, we can cover this deficit and move on to bigger and better things because now the property belongs to the Muslims. It doesn't belong to any one person. It belongs to the believers. And we can grow and we can expand and we can and, you know, uh, create jobs. When other places like Walmart and Kmart and they move into places, they, in order for them to move into cities, they have to prove to the government of those cities why it's a good idea for them to open up business and how many jobs they will create in that area. What about what Tarabiya is offering here? How many jobs has Tarabiya offered to brothers and sisters in this area? How many children have been educated in a private Islamic school for the price of an education that you probably couldn't find in any other Islamic school? What is Tarabiya offering? And we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to reward the brothers and the sisters who have uh, 
um, who are responsible for bringing this project into fruition and we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to allow this project to grow and to increase the wealth of the believers and to remove our fear of losing our wealth from our hearts so that we can do with Allah's wealth what he commanded us to do because the only thing that stops us from doing what is necessary with our wealth is fear and this is why Allah mentions in the Quran that shaitan he promises you poverty he promises you poverty and he encourages you to do foul and evil deeds. This is shaitan that promises you poverty. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala promises us ghina, promises us wealth, promises us richness. And it doesn't necessarily mean that it's tangible richness, but the richness of the heart is sufficient. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows best. Wassalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.